Hey, everybody. My name is Manish Sethi, and my presentation is called Money, the Greatest Story Ever Told. About seven million years ago, the human species evolved. And for almost seven million years, we've never lived in tribes of larger than 150 people. But something changed about 10,000 years ago, something that made our species able to surpass our biological limit. What was that secret? The secret was the power of story. You see, when human beings evolved language, we suddenly were able to talk about things that aren't really there. We're the only animal able to do that. And there are three stories that shaped the history of humanity. I call these the three humana stories. I'd like to tell you these stories right now. The first story is this. What others tell you is true is true. This is the story of empire. This is the story of law. This is the story of government. All of these are concepts, things that don't actually really exist. These are stories that enabled one person to have control over another person. Now the second story is the story of what you believe is true is true. This is the story of religion. It's a story of belief and the story of faith. But it's also the story of, I could never quit my job and travel. I could never go to South America, that place is unsafe. Or I could never throw away all my possessions and go live in the wilderness. Stories that we create in our head that we truly fundamentally believe that are unfalsifiable. This story is very important because it shapes and frames the way that we see the world. Now these two stories were extremely powerful. They enabled human beings to grow past our biological limit, create empires, create nations, invent agriculture, create the great pyramids, but they paled in comparison to the third story. The third story was invented about 3,000 years ago. It allowed humanity to not just create small, independent, and often warring tribes, but actually connect all the tribes together into one giant civilization that we currently live in. That story is this. What you believe that others believe is true, is true. This is a story of trust. This is a story of trade. And of course, this is the story of money. Now money is a really interesting story that I think most of us tend to believe in. I've been in Windsor for about two days, I've been at three restaurants and I've heard three conversations and all of them were about money. I found really interesting. Now think about it. When you go, money is the first story that creates a depersonalized, universal story of trust. Think about it, when you go to Europe or South America and you go to a cafe, why would the barista ever give you food or wine? The barista doesn't know you, most likely the barista doesn't even like you, but somehow you're able to obtain that food or wine. Why? Because you believe in a piece of paper that has a picture of a dead president or a building on it, in this case an Illuminati pyramid, and that barista believes in that same piece of paper. So you're able to exchange services and food and goods because you believe that the barista will believe that that piece of paper is true. Does that seem to make sense? But actually that story was a little bit of a lie. Because how many of us actually use cash money anymore? I'd love it right now if you could raise your hand if you use a credit card or a debit card more often than you use cash. That's pretty incredible. The fact is, money has changed. In the last 50 years, we almost rarely use cash money. It's not in God we trust anymore, but it's in Visa we trust. In 1971, the US dollar was de-pegged from the gold standard. That enabled us to create much more digital representations of wealth, wealth that isn't actually there and has no fundamental basis in reality. When you get paid, do you get paid in cash? Do you get paid in gold bullion? No. You get digital points that are transferred from some digital system to your other digital system, and because you see these points, because we grew up with this point system, we believe it's true. But that doesn't mean it's real. 
And if there's one thing you can take away from this presentation, it's this. Money is a story. It's a story that's told every time a transaction takes place. And that story is changing. It's not about limitations anymore. It's about potential. Less than $5 out of every $1,000 in the world's current money supply is real. I'd like to show you the state of the world's current money supply. For the next few slides, you're going to see blocks that look like this. It's a lot bigger on this monitor. Each of these blocks represents 100 billion US dollars. If anybody has an extra block they want to share with me or the audience after the show, please meet me at, at the break. Um, so first of all, let's look at the wealth of the 50 richest people in the world. There's about 100 people in this room, so just take this half of the crowd, put 50 really rich people there, and you're going to get about $2 trillion worth of wealth, a little less than that. This is all of the US dollars, coins, and banknotes currently in circulation. You might notice something interesting. The 50 wealthiest people in the world, just this half of the room, congrats guys, has more wealth than all of the US dollars currently in circulation. When we look at all of the world's cash and money supply, there's about $7.6 trillion of usable coins and banknotes in the world. Now compare that to the stock market. This is the stock market. There's about $70 trillion in the stock market, but is it real? Think about it, when Snapchat went public the day before and the day after, was there really 25 billion more dollars in the world? Where did it all come from? And where did it all go? This is the size of the debt market. Unfortunately, there's a lot of this being cut off, but this is the size of the debt market. There's about $210 trillion in the debt market. Something very interesting about debt is that a third of the $210 trillion was added in the last decade alone. That entire uh, stock market across the entire globe was added to the debt market in just the last decade. Now these numbers look big, they look huge, $210 trillion, a lot of money, but they pale in comparison to the derivative. The derivative was a financial instrument that was created in 1973. It allows banks and financial institutions to create a new sort of asset that's based on what another asset would do. If you think about a stock as being a bet that the price will go up, a derivative is a bet on that bet. You might know it as a future, an option, a warrant, a swap, but regardless, it's a very exponential type of wealth. And this is all the money in the world, and this is derivatives. Each one of these blocks are $100 billion, all assets that don't really exist, aren't really there, and were all created in the last 50 years. 1.2 quadrillion dollars that doesn't exist whatsoever. Now, it's kind of weird to see that, don't you think? First time I saw that graph, it kind of made me feel very odd, a little worried, maybe scared. But I'm hoping after we look at the next few slides that you won't feel worried or scared and not angry. Many people get very angry at that graph. Because it seems like we live in a world of scarcity. It feels like when the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Numerically, that might be true, but it's not. Because my, I, I, I went to college and my friends were all graduating just, lot, just at the same time as the 2008 financial crisis. I remember them continuously telling me and posting online, it's just not fair. It's just not fair, man. Like, our parents had great jobs, but we just got screwed. The rich are greedy and they're taking away from us. It's just not fair. They were complaining from their parents' basement in an air-conditioned room where they watched Netflix, played video games, drank clean water, and pooped on toilets. They live richer than the richest king of even 50 years ago, much less all of the humans who've lived for the last seven million years. And this brings us to the future of money. Right here at the top left, you can see most of the world's currency supply. On the right, you see all of the derivatives that were created and so small you can't even see the 1.2 quadrillion lines. But you see that small little orange box right there? That's Bitcoin. That's the size of Bitcoin's market cap right now. 
Bitcoin represents a, a, a version of the future story of trust. Trust is a story. Money is a story. Bitcoin represents the first version of that story that's decoupled away from the first two humana stories. It's the first version of money that isn't governed by gold, it's not governed by governments, it's not governed by religions, it's not governed by empires. It's the first version of trust that's governed by technology. Now think about it. Those three humana stories, don't you feel like the first two have kind of gotten a little weird? How, much of us, how many of us truly believe in our governments like we used to believe in our governments? Hasn't it gotten really strange in the last few years? How many of us believe in religion in the same way our parents believed in religion? Those two stories are stories of scarcity and they're decaying stories. But the story of trust, that's a growing story. And in a world, Bitcoin represents the first version of money that anybody can create, the first version of trust that anybody can create based on technology. And now if money is a story, and if for the first time ever anybody can create money, then in the future, the best story will win. I would like to propose a new story. A story that's not based on scarcity, but based on abundance. A story that's not for the 1%, but for the 100%. A story that's not about the individual, but about the collective. I'm the founder of the company Pavlock. We make wearable technology, electronics, apps, and courses that help people break bad habits, form good habits, and become the kind of person they know they could be. But something's really interesting these days, where across the globe, there are more overweight and obese people than there are people who are hungry. Suddenly, it's become a world where it's so easy to set goals, but so hard to stick through with them. At my company, I really focus heavily on getting people psychologically to change their habits. And one of the most important things for helping people form good habits is a positive reinforcer, a reward for doing good behaviors. So about a year ago, we introduced a digital currency, the first ever, uh, first ever behavioral currency. It's like a point system that rewards you for doing good habits. Users are able to track their habits. When they simply do good behaviors, they earn a small amount of volts. And when they commit to doing a behavior, sort of like making a bet on their behavior, they'll win even more from a pool. When everyone succeeds, everyone wins. That's a story of abundance. The better that everyone does, the better that everyone does. Now, it's our vision that we can create a new type of currency, a currency based on abundance, one that every single person across the globe, whether you're rich or poor, whether you live in America or Africa, is able to earn a living wage. We have it written on a wall in our Boston office, $30,000 per year for anybody who succeeds with their daily habit goals. We believe, and, we've, and I honestly think that we've cracked the code on how every single person across the globe is able to earn enough money to survive. I look at basic income and the ideas of how basic income is necessary in order to make the future exist, and then I look at governments and religions, and I think, is that ever gonna happen from government? Is the government ever gonna actually give everyone in the world money? I can't see that happening. Someone's gotta do it, and I think that we figured out a way to make it happen. And so I ask you, can you imagine living in a world where everyone is able to be paid enough, what is equivalent right now of 30,000 US dollars, no matter where you were born, no matter where you are, in order to live your life? A world where you're not paid by other people telling you what they want you to do, but you're paid by yourself doing the things you want yourself to do. Is that a world you want to live in? If so, if you can see this vision, I'd ask you right now, to please stand up. If this is a world, awesome, it's amazing. I'm honestly humbled by how many of you are standing and can see a sort of vision that I see. I believe that this is the future and I believe that a story, in order to be real, must be understood, shared, and believed. If you feel inspired by the story, I'd encourage you to visit pavlock.com slash TEDx You'll be able to, you'll learn how the story works, how it's possible for everyone to succeed, and how all of us can share the story and make it real. Because together, 
I believe that we can create a new story, a story of abundance, not scarcity. Uh, together, I believe we can create a story for the 100%, not the 1%. Together, I believe we can create a story for the collective, not for the individual. And together, I believe we can create a new, greatest story ever told. Thank you very much.